for being here. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, to, to the group because, um, you know, without Wireshark and tools, our company just couldn't possibly exist. I wanted to uh, give you guys a bit of a flavor of another thing you may not have seen, which is the industrial Ethernet world. Uh, I really did not bring any packet traces because I wanted to give you a sense of the overall project and the type of things that it had industrial Ethernet and how Wireshark fits into that. Although I'd be glad to answer any specific questions about the general methods, methodology, and how specifically it's used, and so on and so forth. Uh, and also, uh, please interrupt and ask questions. Uh, you may have to shout out me a little bit because I'm very hard at hearing. <laughs> so shout, wave your hand or something to get my attention. I, I love to be interrupted and try to ask questions. And so I love audience participation. So and, and I'll try to move through the uninteresting stuff fast and get to the interesting stuff. So okay. Anyway, I'm Mike Hines. I'm president of Wire 20. Uh, I won't bore you too much. Uh, we have offices in Houston and Aberdeen. We have a lot, all of us had a lot of experience in network analysis, telecoms. We mostly came out of the energy background, satcom, microwave, radio, this or the other. A couple of other, my partners in the company were the two guys that invented a lot of the early day stuff that you guys would laugh at, but it was like telex over HF radio type stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I have another presentation I'll do about talking about the history of comms in the energy industry. It's pretty fascinating. We'll go into that here. But essentially, we offer network engineering and analysis as a service. Uh, so, you know, we supply the lab equipment and expertise to customers on a simple contract basis, uh, lab simulation testing, incident problem management, traffic engineering, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a few in house tools. We have our own PCAP probes that I'll go into a little bit. And then we offer standards based stuff, uh, uh, training and support, but uh, Rugged equipment with remote management, high performance. And again, it's a, it's a kind of niche market, normally lower bandwidth. So, okay. so what is Ether on Ethernet and why we're going to talk about it in this project? Well, simply stated, Ether, industrial Ethernet is not different than standard Ethernet like you think of an office, except it simply must work. Because typically it's focused on machine to machine comms. But lives and huge economic values are at stake, and it's focused on plant process and control. So you're, you're, you know, you're trying to control some sort of a system at the supervisory level, and if you don't get it right, you, know, you can have fires, things blow up, people die. So it's of extreme importance to get it right. Another attribute is it usually directly contributes to the revenue stream of an organization. You know, I don't mean... You know, for instance, the contrast, if, you're, if you don't get your email, well, it's maybe an inconvenience, but it's very rare. That's a life-threatening event. Or impacts revenue. On the other hand, if a plant can't produce product, that instantly uh, impacts revenues. And it's similar, not dissimilar, to the Citibank gentleman whose presentation I really enjoyed because, you know, they can directly attribute a revenue stream if their network goes down and they can't swipe those Visa cards, they're in trouble. So that's the sort of thing that fascinates us that we try to address. And typically the other thing is installations require detailed approvals by uh, classification societies such as DMV and all that to get insurance. And their specs, there'll be a variety of specs like a cable tie must be on the cable every meter or something. There'll be a wide variety of things so the the project can get insurance. And it's likely to be a hazardous environment just to throw a little more joy in the in the plant. So so the project is there was this there was a vessel in under construction called the uh, motor vehicle well enhancer, put it being commissioned by a company called Helix ESG. And it was conceived to be the largest, most high-tech offshore service vessel, very high market visibility to the client, and they demanded it just must work. You know, lives, money. Uh, this is uh, the the cost of this vessel. I can't reveal it exactly, but it, the the it, it's the number starts with a B, not an M. So it's very expensive. So we were identified to to make it happen. We're independent. 
we had to design the experience, implementation, field acceptance test properties. Yes? What is a service vessel? I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so we were brought in on the network side, you know, so I'll try to explain where we're, we're we did the little bits of glue of the network and stick this whole vessel together, and we'll describe the process and why this. So this is the MV Well Enhancer. It's a big vessel that you can see on the foredeck. Uh, there's a, this is a helipad. The distance from here to here is about 10 stories. Uh, and I'll have another picture or two. Uh, here's, a, here's a side view. You can, you, can, uh, you can see this. The big crane over there, I forget how many metric tons it is. This is a thing here. This is a, the drilling tower. They can actually insert stuff into the into wells that sit on the subsea, and and then uh, intervene. You know, stuff put stuff in and take stuff out. And I don't want to go into the, all the specifics of the oil industry here. They're very sophisticated, and they can do it in rough water and so on. And they put divers in the water, saturation divers, and they put ROVs, you know, remote operated vehicles. And actually, it's a little known fact that the the oil industry does almost all the Navy's recovery efforts at extreme depths because the technology is actually better. So a lot of this stuff is subcontracted to the civilian industry. In fact, I did the comms on the, on the vessels that, remember the Kursk, the Soviet sub that said, the Dutch company got the contract, there was another Norwegian company that, that had to dive support divers in the water, we did the comms on that. Sensitive. Uh, and so what is it like? Well, this is a Ticonderoga-class uh, uh, missile cruiser. That vessel is bigger than a Ticonderoga-class vessel. So, it's 132 meters, 12,000 tons. Uh, top of the tower is 50 meters above sea level, 120 people on board, uh, diesel-electric propulsion equipment, 150 me uh, 15 megawatts of generator, six engines and three engine rooms. It's so-called DP Class 3, meaning they can, you can put this thing on a spot on the earth and it will hold within a meter, meter and a half under extreme conditions. And the Class 3 means you can blow out three, two of the three redundant systems and the system will still hold station. And that's all critical if you're next to these multi-billion dollar rigs or you have divers in the water. So it has to survive. And by, by, and I'm not talking about minor feather or something, it can stand a fire under a third of the ship, and the ship still has two systems up and running. So it's a very, very sophisticated device. And uh, then they have 18 divers on board living in four, X, uh, four times uh, four separate pressure chambers uh, that then, you know, put shifts on, dive to the ocean floor, do work, and all that. And all this can be done simultaneously. Uh, so what is the network on this thing like? Well, compare it to this. It's a ship with a crew, plus a power station, plus an airport, plus a hotel for 120 people. So the network has to cover the needs for work, safety, personal use, and regulatory. And we get to do it all over the equivalent of a 512 by 512 DSL that's 140,000 miles long. So we got that <laughs> common. And you can't possibly design this network to be functional without knowing the traffic. Hence, you've got to look at the packets. There's no other way. You know, we've looked at every tool in the world and used every tool in the world. But it all comes down to sophisticated packet analysis using a tool like Wireshark. And it's absolutely critical. It's a key item to getting it right. Because here, you know, the problem is, which I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate, you have massive amount of data that's being generated on this vessel very limited uh, path to the outside world. So you have to get the priorities right. You have to know what's ingressing and egressing on the network, and you have to simply get that right. Yes, sir? Uh, is it maybe wired or wireless all the way? Wired. <laughs> the wireless internet does not work on a vessel. Now, some may violently disagree with that, but you know, I can set, say safety. I can, set, I can tell you about all the steel in this vessel and how you're ever going to solve the propagation problem, and then if you have the Mr. Kismet guy coming around, penetrating and all this, just ain't there. I mean, this is, this is copper and fiber all the way. Uh, so how does this start? Well, it's a little poor picture, but that's uh, one of our employees in a bare room. You know, this is where this thing starts. Here's another picture. 
this is again a poor picture, but this is the bridge just sitting in a shipyard. So this is where we had to get involved because everything has to be certified. The placement of the wires, the cable trays, the securing of that. I mean, this is you know a ground up engineering project. That you you know, so we've been three years on this, and the thing is not finished really yet. Uh, this is one of the ending points. This is the comms room. Four servers, redundant SAT comms, the CTEL controllers controlling the, the stabilized satellites, redundant UT, UPS, and then pretty well off the shelf Cisco switches and routers. You know, it's nothing exotic on the base equipment of the network. I mean, standard Cisco switches, standard Cisco routers for the core. But when you look at things, this is a this is an Ethernet switch. Kind of doesn't look like Cisco anymore. And that reason is it's in a hazardous environment in what they call the cementing control, or all this over here. And you can start to see some of the considerations. Notice all the, you know, the securing of the cables, the type of connectors, the box the enclosure, and then all the certification. So you know, it's a 100 meg switch, but it's a really expensive 100 meg switch. And you know, here's one of our employees building the network. And again, you can just start to see the details of all the cabling that's done. Then you know, everything has a cable tray. Everything is secured very properly and all this. We're just talking about physical error here. But it's so critical to get this right because you just cannot stand the failure. And uh, made a statement, cabling, it's not your office network. This is, this is how it has to be done. You know, everything is... It is run and secured in order and labeled and so on and so forth. You know, you'd kind of like to see office networks a little better than this, but or, uh, more like this. But and and the even the type of cable it's set, it's what they call a class seven armor that has uh, you know it's actually steel armoring in it, and it's uh, uh, has a special. It goes beyond the normal plenum rated stuff. You can't uh, can't put it out. Of, uh, of any hazardous gases and has to resist heat and so on. Very expensive stuff. And if you have to penetrate a bulkhead or a deck, this is how you have to do it. You run the cables through, and those are elastomers that as you run them through, you pack it all together and squeeze so it has no way that, that gas or water can penetrate between secured areas on there. I have a question. Yes, sir. Why do you use armored cable in that situation? Is it because it's going through metal and has the chance to be cut? Or? It, it's just to prevent the hazard of somebody accidentally whacking a, a cable with a, a sharp or blunt a object so you have the, so that there's no question of it being severed by a simple mechanical blow or something like that, typically. Now, there are a number of hazardous areas where gas could be present that would be explosive. And there, you don't run, you have to have an e either you have to run it in EX, explosive rated enclosures and cable, which is so expensive that even guys like this can't afford it, except in very, very special. So what you do today, it's very simple, you use fiber. So we, there's a lot of fiber in this vessel because you're carrying no electrical sparking energy potential. And so fiber is a really good thing in this. It's massively cheap, it's so easy to run. You still have to worry about armoring for mechanical damage, but you don't have to have the electrical hazard, which is a very, very nice thing. Do you have to worry about grounding? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, yes. Grounding is a very critical thing. All engineered, everything is you know, properly engineered with, with a very elaborate grounding system and then checked by you know, the ship's electrician and the uh, certification authorities and so on and so forth. Is, it, is everything here running on DC? No. No, it's not. It's a mix of AC and DC. So this, this is shielded to sit peg in, in essence? Yeah, it's SDP. I mean, the, the internal uh, construction is like any, any uh, you know, shielded, twisted, uh, standard cable. It, it, you know, it's the, it's the extra shielding and extra armoring and all that. So one of the tests we had to run was there's a long run down the ship, just to give you an example of what they want to see. And they have a bunch of, I think it was 14 kV DC, kilovolt DC, uh, power to the thrusters. So there was a long run of that. And, you know, we were about a meter away in the cable tray. But the spec was we had to take the network cables and wrap them around the 14 kV DC, put cable testers on, and look at the rate as they ramped up and down the thrusters 
and you know sucked out hundreds of amps through that. And we had to have no induced problems into the network. For instance, then we got cut rapid. Once we proved that, and then cabled it back up properly. So, so were you guys still impeded by the 320 or 100 meter? Well, you have, yeah, yeah. So you have to watch that, and you know we put in. It, it's a. Uh, uh, I think I have some statistics on where we, uh, uh, how we had to do it. But yeah, it, it's properly designed to make sure that the Ethernet segments are proper. And it's a, it's it's kind of like an office at the at the core. You know, we had some, we had you know core outers, core switches, and the distributed switches, mostly connected by fiber at strategic areas in the vessel. So we broke up all the runs. So we absolutely, with all the torture it's passed, never exceeded the Ethernet limit. But it, in that respect, it operates like ordinary Ethernet, and you have to adhere to those specs. And we probably cut it down for safety to half, you know, maybe allowed only half the standard run. Yes, sir. So, the ship, is it completely self-contained? I mean, I yeah. you know you have satellite links that go out to connect you to, to like headquarters or whatever. What, what happens if forever, you know, like satellite links go down, you cache data, or, I mean, what? Well, is it just, or are you just out of luck? No, what, what, what happens is there's many levels of redundancy, and, the, and there's two main SATCOM channels, two, two SATCOM units of 512 by 512 each. Then on top of that, there is a, uh, you know, a, like a wideband in Marsh, well, as wideband as in Marsh, I guess, a pair of those guys. And then there are several layers of iridium radios backdooring and having emergency mm -hmm. channels. And then there's the Global Marine Distress Channels, and then there's the VHF radios, and then there's the HF radios, and then there's the beacons that for the landing. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a whole layers. But if this vessel goes off the air, truly, they're going to be dispatched a flight to this thing within a minute or something like that, because that would mean... So for sending data, you use the radio phones? As no, well? no, we can just... The, the, the primary data channel is always the VHF. Yeah, yeah. I, although I, I believe it's set, I think we have the router set up. There are there is a small data stream for very basic telemetry that can be sent off the vessel by one of the wideband iridium, uh, a wideband inbox sats. Okay. And just to show you, I don't want to go into the mechanics of this, but this crane over here has, for instance, ten Ethernet devices, and this and this tower has twenty Ethernet devices, and so. What happens, the vendors of these cranes and devices will have control systems and all, and they're deterministic PID controllers, joysticks, and all that. And so our job was not to screw with that. That is the crane vendor, that's the power vendor, that's the motor control guy. But what we did is weave all that together at the higher levels so for visibility and writing it into the databases and so on and so forth. Are yes. most of those Ethernet connections on those devices like? SNF key monitoring of specific aspects of each device, or are they at the actual control level? No, it's the actual control. I mean, it's a supervisory level of control, and in some cases, it's just visibility. It depends on what the device is. Is that, is that clear? Or no? Yeah, I was just wondering whether it was the actual controls or whether most of them were for monitoring. Or... No, no, most everything, not everything, but most everything can be monitored and controlled <clears throat> from virtually any point of presence on the vessel. No, is not this, everything. Is this a gigabit network or is it? Yeah, yeah it, 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 it's gig and hundred combined. Okay. Du, uh, dual core. Uh, we have two independent gig cores in the network, and then I'll show. You. And this is an example of a of a. Uh, again, you guys have seen this, but maybe not into this uh, level uh, of implementation. This is a this is a closed circuit TV camera, closed circuit TV, IP67. You have know, the weatherproof and all this. Uh, industrial defect, Ethernet, it's all video, no analog, uh, it's you know, pure IP video stream, and also, interestingly enough, the pan, tilt, zoom of the unit is all IP controlled. You know, you're not doing like the old uh, old system where you're applying DC voltage to motors remotely, and no, all this is IP controlled all the way, and you can start to see, you know, the, the type of connectors, cabling, and all that's required to survive in this environment. And again, it all, once it's installed, it has to be inspected for, you know, both the physical level and then the logical operation post. Yes, sir. How do you uh, take into account like the corrosive effects of CA on like the cabling and all that? Because once you install it, like pulling new cables could be a real pain, right? So it, it's oh, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's 
a tough job. What, 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 everybody knew the reality on the project. It was a very, very good, very senior, very experienced, uh, very experienced project manager on the Helix side that had lived through the horrors of badly designed stuff. And he was extremely good about trying to you know, do everything to assure that the change orders were kept to a minimum and that, for instance, you know, if we would then come in and say, he'd say, well, I need six pair and I'll give you two inches. And we said, no, 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 let's get like a six inch conduit here. So what we tried to do was have input to the project always when they were laying out the physical structure that we had room enough to pull or modify all, because you, you can imagine the horror once you get in there and somebody needs another pair and there's no space left. It's, you know, really expensive. So the, there was a very, very, very conscious effort that, uh, that we drove from the side we could, but the project manager on this was a very experienced, so he was a Dutch gentleman, very, very good. He's seen it all before, and so he tried to do a very excellent job of that. And still, there were mistakes. I mean, we redesigned the whole layout four times probably because you know, some major bit of gear would be, and I mean, when I'm talking about a major bit of gear, I'm, you know, talking about 10 ton unit that <laughs> suddenly had to go three dash down that caused chaos, and so there was lots of redoing, but that's why you have to get in so early to, to do this. Yeah. How long does the copper last in, in, in CA? Uh, I'm sorry, how long does... How long does the copper in the uh, Ethernet cable last in well, CA? Well, um, the predecessor to our company... <laughs> did a bunch of the original wiring, physical structured wiring, the first structured wiring that was put in, in the North Sea on a lot of the rigs, and that stuff is still in business today, and that was done in the mid to late 80s, mostly running some IBM SNA and DetNet, believe it or not. And then it's been adapted through the years to Ethernet, and it's still functioning today, so with relatively minor changes. So it's quite long life. Yes, sir. So to do that, do you use special gas type connectors, or do you just put everything inside a, an enclosure to protect? T typically, you put it inside an enclosure. That the uh, yeah, exactly. You, you you run it into a junction box with essentially packing glands, and then you'll have a special termination. I don't know if I have the detail to show you that, but you'll you'll terminate that on a special strip of some sort by the manufacturer. And then from there, then you use standard Ethernet jumpers typically to your switch or whatever device, and then going out reverse. So, you know, so it's kind of a multi-tiered thing. So, it's all certified. So you've always got a couple layers of insulation between between the copper and the outside world. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Always. Always. And and again, it depends. You know, that would be the process. You would be in a non-explosive, non-hazard area. It's got to be that good. When you're in explosive, that's a whole other level. Yeah. Then you've got solid armor. Yeah. Well, in that kind of multiple termination situation where you're obviously inducing some impedance anomalies into the cable, yes. uh, do you have trouble getting full uh, speed certification in those cables? We, we didn't. I mean, I think it was because just very conservative physical level design. The, the guy from our side that did it was he's, his original training was a Rolls Royce in the old days at Rolls-Royce in Glasgow, Scotland for power systems. So this guy is a craftsman, you know, so he just designs it conservatively and right because he was used to dealing with power systems for airplanes and jet engines and plants. So, you know, and he's Scottish, so <laughs> it's kind of, you know, done right. And so I think conservative design is just kind of a must here, and so you just tend never to, just, you don't push to the edge of anything. You know, you, you are very conservative in every aspect, physical air, impedance issues, RF issues, all the way, you know, at the physical level. Uh, this is a picture of saturation dive control. Guy on the left is actually a diver, the guy on the right is a dive electrician, and this is the, the, a typical dive control. They can have, I, of 18 divers, I think they can put nine in the water, at least, at least nine, maybe more simultaneously. And so you have, you'll have an odd combination of the old analog gauges that have been used since day one with levers and dials because that's the most basic level of redundancy. But there's a shocking level of sophistication. The, the, we have IP nodes in the di on the divers, the, the video from the divers, the, the statistics, the health statistics is IP and integrated into the vessel also. So... You know, the diver it has a couple IP nodes on him, 
they're IP addressable <laughs> and visible. So if you need to go see the respiration rate of a diver, you can see it anywhere in that vessel, for instance. But you know things like the oxygen and nitrogen. One of you know one of those guys goes twists knobs and watches analog gauges filled with you know black hole, just like you know World War One, World War Two movies would be in a, in a way. So it's a weird combination of low and high tech. Uh, oh, and you were asking, this is an example, I don't know how clear the detailing is here, but this is a, a you know, again, not your standard office, but you can see the, the runs coming in here terminated on this strip, and then here is, your, here is your switches, some power supplies out here and all that, so that's the kind of standard arrangement. And again, I'm sorry, you know, it's, it's running not at enough resolution to really show you the, the detail. Yes, sir. Um. In the previous image with the camera, it showed that you had like uh, external like bulkhead connectors or uh -huh. similar in an outdoor environment. Are you injecting uh, grease in before you uh, terminate your cables in there? Uh, you know, I, I I believe mostly they take a specific dial corning, uh, inert silicon, high vis stuff, and typically the way I've seen it done, and I am not the expert at the physical layer that some of these other guys are. But you typically smear this special dielectric dial pointing <coughs> it's about 34 bucks a tube. So it's, it's expensive stuff. And you, and you tend to fill in any potential voids, then you make it. And then there's usually special amalgamating heat shrinks and all that that then get put on top of it. But in addition to that, the connector itself, when you assemble it, is a multi-part piece with packing glands. And as you, as you tighten down the back shells on these things, that seals the cable. Plus, the male and female has is like mill spec connectors. They're actually sealed pins. So when you solder or crimp the pin and push it in, that runs through a hermetic barrier. Just exactly. I mean, it's a standard. Any military guy would recognize those things instantly. So it's kind of a double layer of redundancy. You're waterproof at the bulkhead, so when you pull it, you don't get penetration. And the male half is 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 is, is secure at the pins, and then on the back side, it's also packed against the cable. Those are expensive. <laughs> and again, approval <laughs> must be. And here is actually, and I'm sorry we don't have a picture of our probe in here, but here is actually a guy using Wireshark to start examining the network. He's one of our employees. But I wanted to point out some of the other qualifications. So additionally, this guy is a top flight Wireshark analyst. He knows network, he knows Wireshark. He's using it on a laptop to tomorrow probe, which unfortunately is out of the picture here. But you see this bag he has, this little orange thing? This is what you really have to have. That little thing is an oxygen sensor. And so he's operating below depths in a vessel without assured ventilation at this stage of construction. And he's got all these nitrogen accumulators around him. And so if, you know, if the uh, air circulation goes bad or if an accumulator would dump the lake, you know, he'd get a non-breathable situation. So so that thing goes off and in his bag, in addition to his screwdrivers and tools and wire termination and his analyzer and all this, he's got an oxygen bottle in there to slap on and all that. So I just wanted to point out there's another whole world that Wireshark and these sorts of tools operate in, you know, that is very visible, but uh, but is a very high value to, to the industry. Yes sir. You mentioned that um, the traffic that is coming to the laptop is coming out of your probe. Yes. Um, what's the probe doing? Okay, well, I'll, I'll show you. So this is our probe, and uh, the way we work, this, this is our little device, but essentially it's a, it's, a, it's a precision packet capture device that we build, and it has an integrated pack uh, and a high-speed uh, capture. It's based on industrial Ethernet with running a high-speed uh, secured Linux kernel. And its job is simply to collect data in a variety. And, and the reason why we designed and built this had to do with the nature of our business. We do a lot of business in uh, hazardous areas or very, very remote areas where the cost of sending a man with a traditional analyzer is so expensive that just nobody does it. So with this device costing a very modest amount of money and so simple, to hook up, we can ship it in a very simple flight case, all weighing less than 10 kilos on a bird, to somewhere, and anybody that can you can communicate with over radio can get this thing attached, 
and it's non intrusive. It's got attacks, fail safe, cut the thing in half, kill the power, doesn't impede the network, and so on and so forth. And then we have a management port built in so we can get to it if we want, but if not, we can just have the guys remove it and ship it back, download the data, and start the analysis. So, the, so this is the kind of fundamental collection device we use, and we really use it because um, in our industry, the access is always a problem. I really appreciate anybody that's ever you know, really tried to troubleshoot a problem and couldn't get a capture in the right spot. That's our life only a hundredfold every day. You know, where can we get to today? You know, it's a constant problem. So and and you know, and believe it or not, the energy industry has budgets like everybody else. They just don't fly people in expensive gear willy-nilly. I mean, everything has to be cost justified. And this is a great approach to be able to get data under a wide variety of conditions and extend our reach and service. So that's it. So there's nothing really magic. You guys are all familiar with packet capture. This does a really good job. We, we, we do occasionally get asked to analyze trace files that somebody sends in. And it's, it's really a mess because we see so many bad captures. Because, you know, they're using a Windows machine that's overloaded and the, and the, uh, and the capture is simply corrupted or the, the timing's bad or whatever because they're, the, the, uh, the machine is being interrupted or whatever, and so it's a problem. So we build a dedicated capture appliance to do that. Uh, the one complaint we have, Wireshark doesn't do analog telephony. <laughs> so, you know, you can see an odd mix of, of things. Another of them, our employees, you know, he's sitting there with a, with a test set, essentially, you know, ringing out analog pairs for the analog system. So, you know, in addition to all this high-tech stuff, there is, there, are, there is a complete analog PBX and analog telephony that runs in parallel with everything, because, again, even though we're redundant three ways on the network side, you have another level of redundancy with that analog sets. You know, they want to be able to grab something, you know, the captain or officers on board or whoever is in the water. You know, they want something to work regardless of what happens, and so that's another level of redundancy here. Uh, here's an example of, uh, again, this is uh, in what's called the pressurized accumulator area. And again, it's in a safe area, uh, but here you, the, here you can see some of the core of the network. Again, standard systems with switches and routers in that sort of area. So again, some of the core network devices are nothing more than off the shelf. Now, they are properly mounted in shockproof racks and all this, but the standard Cisco kit and others, or Dow, or whomever, does a pretty good job, you know, in the right spot. It's just, you have to, uh, you know, this is the area that you can have that, whereas in the other areas, I showed you the little highly specialized industrial switches, you know, it's where it's physically located. Yes, sir? Also, although I see in terms of the uh, conservation uh, approach, although those are all 1U devices that can go next to each other in a normal environment, Yes. You have one use space between you. Yes, you notice that. <laughs> Again, it's just a detail, but it's one of those things for, you know, you don't want the thing, if the, if the vessel's twisting and pitching and all that, you don't want motion in your act to cause things. And, and, and believe it or not, the, 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 this isn't sloppy wiring. That is precisely the way it has to go because you have to have so much specified movement available and all this. Yes, sir? You said it's just mostly off-the-shelf equipment. Being on the sea like that, all of the boards don't have to be conformal coded? No, or not necessarily. Depends on the zone. Again, this is in a highly available, air-conditioned, safe core area of the vessel. Uh, and, and again, you know, the, the, you can't have everything be to the, to the you, don't, you don't need everything to the most rigorous standard that can possibly exist on a thing like that because it would be... Those sorts of devices usually are very low functionality. You know, like a little switch like that is a pretty low power device. It's only going to have eight ports on there's it. No mil, there's no mil specs. Right? No, 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 not here, not here. There is in other areas, sure. but again, it's zoned out. I mean, you talk about zone, zone one, zone two, zone three, EX, and all this. And so everything on the vessel by area is classified as to where it's at, and then what is in that area has to be conformal to this zone. So this is in something like the living quarters where a human has to have 
a certain environment to exist, and that's good enough in here. So their climate control is just that good that they can basically erase that as a variable? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, and just like the air cons and the air handlers, there's three three levels of redundancy on that stuff too. And uh, good. another question. So, so yeah, yeah, oh yeah. When you go in there, it's perfect climate. You know, you just feel the air move. It's really nice. It's not so nice in the construction when you're in the Gulf with no air conditioning. <laughs> but when these things are in operation, they're really pleasant, you know, and clean. I mean, you can't believe you go on the bridge. You know, you'll have your coveralls on. You have to strip those off, and. Then, uh, you know, no boots. You know, you're in your bare socks or slippers. You get clean. Uh, this is the example. This is the this is Ken's crane. Uh, you know, the guy drives it. This cyber chair. He sits there, and it's like the ultimate gamer's nightmare. You know, he has a, two joysticks uh, and so on, networked into the vessel. So you know, the the, the real time control, the PID controller, is all local to the crane, and determine, and that's all deterministic stuff. Short runs of wire with sensors and actuator, and it's all uh, not you know kind of the bang bang stuff. It's all proportional stuff with you know DC motors and all that driving this and all that. And, and the operator has you know all the real time loads and all that. But that same crane is completely visible everywhere in the vessel. You know they, the captain or any of the mates can see the where exactly the crane is, how much loads on it, how much wire is paid out, and all that anyway. Uh, SATCOM, here's uh, one of the uh, CTELs, it's a, I think it's 1.4, 1.5 meter KU, this is one of them, without the ray dome, and you can start to see the mechanism of how it's gyro stabilized um, for the ship motion, it can wrap, it can go 360 and lock to lock 180 and three axes. So you can, the vessel can do anything in the think wheel track. Uh, this is a picture. This is it right here installed. This is a high rate Inmarsat unit. Just to give you a, and, and it's symmetrical. There's another one on the offside. And here's a summary of the network. Uh, switch, switches, uh, twin hop switches, uh, resilient gate core. Uh, we put in about 100 miles of copper total, uh, plus five. We didn't count the five, but that's a lot. <laughs> So we put in 25 configured VLANs. We've got eight in service. So there's you know general desktop PCs, printers, about 40 devices, voice, about 30 VoIP devices, plus a full general PBX that's not coupled. Uh, CCTV have 60 CCTV channels, inside monitoring of winches, external monitoring, diver helmet, video, audio, ROV cameras, and all that, all IP. And then control, we have five separate VLANs for control. Uh, that's the that's running the Modbus TCP, Profinet, et cetera, all the way to HTTP, and then dual VSATs to the shore, each 512 by 512. Uh, so the traffic engineering level now is uh, everything is uh, classed at layer two for land forward using uh, uh, 802.1p. Uh, layer three uh, for VSAT land forward, you get served marking QSQs and routers. And we're running a symmetrical 512 uh, uh, kilobits. So, you know, we have significant bottleneck right there from the start. And so we have, as I said earlier, you don't have to deliver all the operational and social requirements for a large industrial city with 120 people in it over the equivalent of very poor DSL. So this is the trick of, you know, uh, elephant and drinking straw trick. And again, they wanted to say, you know, it's just absolutely not possible to do this correctly without tools like Wireshark. Yes, sir. You notice, uh, you just said that the PBX wasn't connected. Is it a backup system? I notice you have voice over IP. Which is we have voice over IP and we have the PBX, parallel, non-connected. And they're not, uh, is it just a backup system, the PBX? No. Uh, mostly, yeah, yeah, mostly. But, but it's, again, they, certain things they demand to be uncoupled. Although, interestingly enough, the, the intercom system, you know, the push to talk intercom, uh, started out as an analog, P, uh, analog uh, uh, intercom. And interestingly enough, they requested and we switched it to a full IP PBX. So when you went and mesh the button, you know, on the, on the looks like the old uh, naval handsets, you mesh the button, and, you know, you put a general call or a zone call, that's all IP, interestingly. Although it started out, traditionally they'd been IP. This is the first, uh, this is the first uh, 
excuse me, they had all been analog. This is the first IP intercom that I had seen in, in this sort of application. So, you know, they're, they're, you know, the industry is funny because you're dealing with all this risk and regulatory things. So certain things that change and certain things don't. And, you know, the, the regulatory and the insurance people have to be satisfied. But essentially, that's the big driver there for everything. Uh, so what do we use for tools, just to wrap it up? Uh, we use the PCAP probes to collect the traffic, 724. So uh, we collect a lot of traffic on this vessel, about a half a terabyte a month. And we use our an internal product called RSD uh, to divide up the traffic to layer two or layer three into classes. It's our little tool that does that. And then we use Wireshark for packet level analysis. I mean, Wireshark is our go-to tool all the time. Yes, sir. So what is RSD again? Well, it, it's our internal tool. I'll have, I'll have to tell you. I mean, it's just our little bit of software that we developed. To, because the problem we have, and this is where I'll get into our approach, we, we fundamentally never input filter anything. We just never do. Because if you were smart enough to input filter, you already know your bloody problem. <laughs> you know? I mean, to me, that's a great quandary of input filtering. So we never input filter, so as a consequence, we collect lots of data. Well, you know, it's, it's the, the Citibank guy had it exactly right, so we're collecting a lot of data because we're running a lot of data through this thing. So we had to have a way to reduce it and, and consider it, and, and it's, it's very much, I, I really liked his talk because it's exactly what we do. You know, you have to understand what, it, what, it, what, it, what is the problem, you know. And if you can talk to the user and get a good idea, it'll help you so much. But essentially, you know, you have to develop a hypothesis, you know, based on your understanding of TCP, layer two, whatever you think it might be. And then you, you know, you develop a hypothesis and, you, and typically we'll do a filter and say, okay, we'll, we want to look at all the ARP stuff. So we'll look at all the ARP stuff and just filter on that, look at it. Or we'll say, no, nah, it's probably layer two. Well, you know, then we'll make a filter there. Or we think VLAN 3 has gone bad, so we'll look at VLAN 3. But a lot of times what you'll find is the problem is really an aggregate problem, not an individual thing. And, it's, and we run into that all the time because we're dealing with such high latency, low, low bandwidth stuff that anomalous behavior gets accentuated 100 times worse right away because you're dealing with TCP, and it's a wonderful protocol, but it's sensitive to latency. And, and, and if you know it and engineer your things right, you can deal with it effectively, but when things go wrong, they go wrong in a bad, violent way, usually, because of all that latency. So, you know, we're merciless about packet loss. I mean, packet loss, we don't want to see it. So, you know, that's, that's the thing we look at a lot, is packet loss. But, you know, you have to be really careful with tools because Wireshark, depending on your heavier your pro, for instance, will interpret simple out of orders. If you do the, the very simple filter, you know, that I'm sure you've all done, do TCP dot uh, analysis flag, or do TCP dot analysis dot lost underscore segment or retransmission, depending on where your pro is at or your, your collection, one side will almost always be accurate, another side will fool the heck out of you, you know, because it'll start showing you, say, lost segments, when in fact they're simple out of orders. So the lessons of really understanding Wireshark, your tool, and the protocol is dead on. You know, it's dead, dead that, that, that statement is absolutely true. You know, don't be blinded by the expert system that says, you know, just because you can do a certain filter, you can go to the extra, expert composite, and you see all this pack plot, Think. Think where your probe's at. Think the traffic through. Think what TCP's doing and there and why the answer. So I guess, it, you know, trying to go into the packet level analysis a little bit, what, what are the problems we see? Well, we've been plagued lately by lots of networks with layer two issues from spanning tree and misconfigured switches. And why in the world anybody would do that, I don't know. But we see a lot of that for some stupid reason. So check that out always. That's a, that's a tip. Look at your layer two. Don't assume it's good. Secondly, Pat, yes, sir. I, I saw in your uh, some of your materials you had a, this enormous problem, which turned out to be a, a duplex problem on a switch. <laughs> <laughs> so the simplest stuff. Can you fight it? Oh yeah. I mean, that's another lesson. You know, that's kind of my, one micro of the rules. You know, check the simple stuff first. You know, look at your switch duplexes. You know, I mean, all this simple stuff. 
plagues people endlessly now and then. And the story, who, who told the story about working 300 hours, the client had worked 300 hours, and then maybe it was Ray over there in another station. You know, they worked 300 hours on a problem that, that was with uh, uh, a, a large uh, equipment firm that bought another large equipment firm that has two initials that's located in Texas. <laughs> I don't know who it was, but let's say it was a very large company. And they were having a problem that they couldn't, uh, print orders, and it was a very complex, elaborate thing. They had spent like 300 man days internally trying to troubleshoot it and called Ray, and then he located the problem an hour because he was smart enough to look at packet trace and immediately realized the problem was that the print queue was disabled and every print job was being reset except the active one because they disabled the print queue. It took him one hour. So, you know, don't overlook the simple stuff. That's a kind of a basic rule. Look at that, and it's easy to look at with a tool like Wireshark. You know, the hard problem in Wireshark, in our business, is we're looking at a huge volume of data. That's the problem. So it's the needle and the haystack anomaly, and that's why we 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 we, we kind of built this little RST utility, RSD. And, and I'll tell you the story of why it's called RSD. If you ever watch late night TV, you'll you'll see a guy on there. I can't remember his name, but he's quite famous. But, but, but he invited, invented a tool called the Ronco Slicer and Dicer. <laughs> so our little utility is named after the Ronco Slicer and Dicer, and we didn't think that sounded too good, so we call it the RSD. <laughs> it slices and dices traffic for us. But, but all its job is, it doesn't do analysis, it just takes a, a, a list, it's very primitive, takes command line input, and, uh, and it's a little analytics thing, and it, and it, and it you know, it dissects and gives us a reduced data set we can operate on with Wireshark. So our goal is let's get something manageable in Wireshark and do it fast so we can look at different aspects repeatedly. Okay, but, but let's see, what are some of the other things? A packet loss I already mentioned. You're dealing with high latency networks. So packet loss is ever critical and it has a much, 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 much worse effect. Then, so if you can get by that, all that, what the next common thing we find is badly written applications. And again, that's parallel to what the Citigroup guy said. You find so many applications that want to throttle packets into the TCP stack, which is absolutely a horrid behavior. They get it wrong every time. Let TCP do its thing. Fill the buffer and go. Fill the buffer, fill it, fill it, fill it, let TCP work. And TCP can be tuned with large windows and all that to operate pretty darn good. But you've got, and so we do a lot of application work where, you know, we use a simulator, uh, uh, you know, off-the-shelf simulators we purchase, put our probes in place, run traffic over it, and answer the question for many organizations, why does my application not work to offshore or to the next campus or whatever? And people don't realize that, you know, running in the data center, you're microseconds away by a layer two switch. That's fact. I don't care what kind of land you are on, you know, 12, 12 miles away of fiber, we had a major client that backed out an entire data center project because their app couldn't run and it had about three milliseconds of latency. That was enough on badly applicated, on a badly architected apps to not work anymore. And the cost of correcting the apps was so poor, they backed it out. So, so, you know, latency, it's a big deal. And application behavior makes latency many times worse where TCP could just handle it. You know, if it was allowed to. Uh, we also have a couple other internal products. Um, we have something called L1 and L2, which again is not packet level analysis. It's more ways that we try to we're, we try to come up ways to help us find the needle in the haystack. But again, it's it's merely an attempt to answer the question of how can we then use Wireshark to look at the packet level analysis and you know. Every day we run into that where somebody will have their Tivoli open view system, and I don't want to offend fans of either, but you know, Tivoli says, you know, Tivoli says it's green. Hey, hey, open view says green, green dials, everything wonderful. All the users are pissed and my application doesn't work. It's green. It must be good. So the only thing we've ever found that is real and true and gets you the answer is packet level analysis. You've got to look at the packets. And again, I'll echo what the gentleman from Citibank said. You know, if you come up with a logical packet analysis, you can then go in front of the server guys and the app guys and have a dispassionate 
engineering-based discussion on how you can fix the problem. And as much as anything, it's a psychology react, psychological reaction where suddenly you're dealing with facts that people have to deal with rather than double finger pointing, oh, it's your bit, my bit, whose bit, you know, and no, no facts, it's just, I don't want to have the problem, so it must be your problem, you know. You get the packet analysis, and that's the facts. You know, if somebody's putting those packets on the wire and they're behaving in a certain way, and it's possible with a little logical deduction and a good tool like Wondershark to tell you, you know, where is that problem? So that, that's why it's so valuable as a cornerstone of everything we did, really, you know. Same with field acceptance tests, you know. You know, you, you run a baseline, you see how it reacts, you run a baseline again, see how it reacts. Then when something goes wrong, acts different, and you know why, you know, because you've got a good baseline. So it's an extremely valuable tool, and I just again want to express my extreme gratitude to the developers and the community around it. It's a phenomenal thing, and it's really the key to, you know, proper engineering of the network to us. Yes, sir. Have you made any use of Pilot and looking at some of the data sets? Uh, we, we looked at Pilot. Uh, we haven't purchased it. Uh, our initial evaluation was, and I, to be fair, I haven't looked at it in detail recently, but it was not dealing well with the volumes of data we dealt with, and also the manner, the way we collect data. We don't capture one big data file. What we do is our instrument, our PCAP Pro, we can tune it for a capture interval. And so what we typically do is we'll set it to an interval like 15 minutes or five minutes or something. And we can do ad hoc too. We find it most useful because we're sitting in line for days, weeks, months, even years in some cases, where we'll collect a file-based structure that's date-time stamped. So we'll have a series of capture files that are date-time ordered. And so when you're dealing with that, uh, a lot of tools don't deal with that. You know, Pilot is oriented toward a single large capture file, but what we would have to do is reassemble some stream and all that. So we have a lot of tools that we script up or operate from time X to time Y, which could be separated in days or weeks, and then operate that way with very simplistic command tools, the goal being then to isolate an area that we'll look at with Wireshark, either T-Shark sometimes that we do some scripting on, or we'll look at uh, it with graphical Wireshark, depending on what the, what the need is. Now, the other tip I might try to give is graphics is good. <laughs> graphics is really good sometimes because you can certainly see certain things by looking at the traces, you know, the packet display on the main window. You can see things, and certain things are very obvious, but other things are not at all obvious. And to me, depending on the nature of the problem, I like to pop up the IO graph or the other packet versus time graphs because certain things become blinding all the obvious. The pattern, you know, human eye is really good at certain pattern recognition. And once you get used to it, that, those are really good tools. So I'd encourage you to become familiar with that. And, and practice is good, you know. Now, I'm lucky because I had a really, really good tutor, uh, Tim Everett, the guy in the first picture, who has been at this as long as any human being that I've ever known. And, you know, he's a harsh master, Scottish guy, a little mean guy anyway. So, you know, he, you know, you, you know his, his theory is look at traces, look at a lot of traces, and, you know, and so on. Yes, sir. So have you got, uh, like for this project, have you got a bunch of files of traces of normal behavior that you can look at? No, yeah, yeah, we have the baseline, yeah. I, I think I have a few words about that. So, so the commissioning process is, you know, proper initial design, and then do this field acceptance testing, and then we use the user tools to you know, confirm the correct configuration of, of traffic flows at layers two and three. And then once we record those and save them off carefully, you know, that, you know, so we'll have a file somewhere stuck on our servers, archived properly, and we'll have a, you know, a, a textual document that's attached to it that that's the field acceptance test, and this was the behavior. So, you know, a comparison could be readily made then, insert a new probe at a, at a point and take a look and so on and so forth. And of course, what that also does is very critical in this environment. The last point, then you can really rapidly respond to operational issues because you have a baseline of known behavior and it's not like you're trying to figure out where the heck I'm at, you know. 
And so, I mean, we've got trace falls. We didn't know where they're collected at. You know, you know, I mean, it's not a big deal. You can generally do it. But everything you can do to eliminate the uncertainty gives you the answer massively faster. So, you know, so we have it defined. Okay, in case of test, the probe at this location will be dumped. And the, the file that needs to be compared to is this, and blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, it's all part of the kind of proper engineering. So, yes, sir? Would you? Oh. Yeah. So, does your, uh, your probe uh, store enough data that if they call you and say, hey, we started having this problem uh, yesterday about 3 o'clock, can you go back in before and after? Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, we have. We have uh, Two versions of storage, depending on the age of our probes or how they were built. But uh, most of them, but not all, have rotating media. That w w these days we use uh, uh, two two and a half inch laptop drives uh, in a RAID one configuration. And you know how laptop drives have gotten bigger in size. You know now I don't know what we buy them, but you know over 100 gig of storage. And so we're not on the 10 gig cores here. We're on, at most, a gig network, and more typically, much lower than that. So generally, we can go weeks in a vessel like this, except maybe on the network core, but certainly hours to a few days. Uh, some of the worst work, I, I hate to do it, because, and, and, uh, and, and you guys live a worse life than I in some ways, but you know, some of the worst jobs you do to me is you, if you sit on a gig core, and have you know looking at everything that's hard because you know you're you, you know you're filling up the probes with bloody fast and you're you're sitting there and typically you have to capture the random disk and write it to the physical disk and you have to do all this very elaborate you know testing steps to try to isolate the problem it's really a pain I mean I mean the banking guys and people that operate on big core networks it's a hard problem. It, it, uh, Again, it, it, it's a really hard problem because there's just uh, the, you can capture at a high rate. Storage at a high rate is really problematic. I mean, it's really a problem. And again, philosophically, you can solve that by filtering. But if you filter, <laughs> you know, you just wasted your problem. So, so, so the challenge at high rate capture is really storage. And then the second order problem is find the needle in the haystack. That's it. I want to uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Ray, for coming in. This is uh, Ray uh, with uh, Gearbit, a good man to know. Uh, uh, Ray, uh, our race company, and our company cooperate and do work for each other every once in a while. Good anal an analyst, so please uh, give him a call. He's got a lot to say, and it's very, very good. Uh, he's a good teacher too. He'll teach you about all this stuff. So, ready. Uh, so I think. Uh, again, I just wanted to say, you know, without Wondershark, this is not possible. And again, I wanted to extend it to you. Thanks. Uh, it, it's a phenomenal tool. It's a fundamental tool. A tool you can't get without. Know it, use it, love it, respect it, contribute to it. <laughs> you know, it's a wonderful tool. I, I don't know if we need developers here, but again, our, our great thanks to the community because it's, it's a phenomenal, fundamental tool that you just, in our view, cannot correctly engineer and analyze the network without. It's just fundamental to our, our success. Uh, and if you have any questions, please feel, the con feel free to contact us. Uh, and that's about it. I mean, I'd be glad to try to answer any other uh, questions about the project or about our approach to troubleshooting. And I'm sorry, I, I, I guess I'm done plenty early here, but uh, I, I didn't really bring any examples along because I figured by now you'd be sick of looking at packet breaks. <laughs> and there are probably other better people than I to answer it, but I did want to kind of talk about some of the general approaches and what we see in the general things, and hopefully that's efficient. If you have a number of independent contractors that are creating, for instance, specific applications, say, for the operation of the crane, uh -huh. independently, um, I would imagine that that gives you the possibility of then, once you get them all in place on a coexistent network, to having uh, operational problems when they try to interact with each other. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. True. True. Very true. Yes, sir. Um, you, you said a moment ago that one of the challenges in, in recording traffic is capturing it to disk. The storage is a challenge. I mean, we, we have built a couple of devices that operate at gig and better rate. 
but you have got to really pay attention to storage. I mean, if you're... Now, one thing we have, have found, the reality is lots of people have gig networks, but they don't really operate at gig speed. I mean, they are, they're bursty, and, and, sure. and so, you know, kind of anything will do. But we evidently... I tell you, if you want to walk in terror, we did some work for British Petroleum BP, and they had several locations in the world but they, but you walk into this one place and they call it their high performance computing center. They have five computing farms, each with 64,000 Linux cores all running Linux, five of these things. And they have a five year cycle, they tear one down, and they buy a fresh one every five years. So the whole farm, the five 64,000 core farm is refreshed every five years. And they've got guys that it's not part of IT because it has their exploration and development knowledge. That's where the big seismic gaps work and all that. Now you go in there and you want to do some work for those guys. When they say gig, they mean gig. I mean, they know how to fill up <laughs> a pipe, you know. And so that kind of stuff, you know, you are challenged with storage, you know, because when you're trying to troubleshoot, say, a single one of their Linux workstations to running against this, this farm of theirs, you know, that workstation instantly lights up at a gig and it just never stops both ways, you know. I mean, they're running so much data to be imaged through that thing. So those are the really challenging things. And what we've had to do is typically come up and try to, with a user, define what the problem is and then run a test within about five minutes. We can take about five minutes to do Yes, sir. So do you end up having to have engineers that make significant modifications to the capture engine in order to get wire speed, no excuses? No, there are a number of uh, solutions out there. I mean, you can buy, you can buy gig. Uh, you, you don't have a pro product. Right? No, we do have a pro product. Yeah, but but we don't go but we don't attempt to go above a gig. A gig is our limit. We don't attempt ten gig. We don't. We, and and I guess uh, just uh, philosophically, we decided as a company, where do we have to be? We saw lots of people operating at increasingly higher speeds. There are some numbers of products you can go buy either a card base or a whole appliance from some companies that operate at a gig and above speeds. So what we, but what we saw and where our expertise was is the low rate industrial edge network stuff where we just didn't see a need to, I mean, we're mostly working on 100 meg networks and into a one meg circuit mostly, you know. So we don't have to have the extreme high-speed capture engines like, are, are you with NAPA? Okay, there you go. We don't have to have his type of technology at the extreme rates. I mean, you know, guys like NAPA Tech, uh, Endace, and, and others, uh, Impulse, which I think is associated in the U.S. with, with NAPA, these guys make very good high-speed capture engines and they probably have storage <coughs> solutions, but I mean, you got multiple layers of problem. I don't want to bore the whole audience unless there's interest. But <laughs> this gentleman, I don't know his name, never met him, but if he's with Napa Tech, I know what he does. So they, they have a coprocessor-based PCI or PCIX card. Oh, you know I love it. Sorry, <laughs> I always have to be careful here because I bore people to know what they're talking about. And is most of your customer base shipped ashore or? Yeah. Just the one, the yeah, you know, we, we do a lot of remote site comms, land and offshore based engineering uh, uh, on the IP side. Uh, we tend not to do the SATCOM level of engineering because, I mean, we could all do land budgets and all that probably, but, you know, really, you, what you really do is you go buy a solution from a vendor who's already done the link budget. So we're, and, and we have the IP level expertise, and those guys have the RF and physical layer expertise, and we, we keep it that way. So we we tend to focus on, uh, we'll say, the high value edge network, uh, meaning it could be a rig, it could be a vessel, it could be a pipeline, it could be a plant, uh, it could even be. We did a, a job for a major company where they had a high value application. It was all totally in a lab, but it was going to be running to the remote sites, but it wasn't running correctly over the land, so it was application optimization again, but it was in a lab, but we impeded, you know, put impairment simulators in line and our couple of probes, so we could see the behavior as the latency and up went up and the bandwidth went down. That was the problem. So we just don't deliberately try to attempt to attack that 
that market. So we don't have, we, we have a different set of problems that I wanted to illustrate because, you know, lots of people, I shouldn't say lots, because I think it's a pack, kind of a rare skill to operate at the really high speed side, but there's kind of the value we add in knowing how to package this stuff and make it work in a hazardous environment and then we're kind of know how to speak the language of the plant process and control and the, you know, if so, somebody says we want an EX enclosure, we'll say, oh yeah, we know how to do that. Or th this kind of thing. So it's where we chose to focus our company more and we try to add value because we're not aware of hardly anybody that's doing sophisticated packet capture in that market and then we see a crying demand. You know, I mean, and we're trying to Spread the word, as it were. Are you doing much in converting um, legacy scale ah, systems? Yes. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Yeah, we do it quite a bit. Uh, that's a really slow <coughs> process because two reasons. One, the capital required to do it is, it is really high, and physically doing it is really hard. So, so when people do a pipeline control conversion or a plant conversion, we typically get involved, but it's a rare event just because the replacement cycle is so so slow. You know, it's kind of like the military flying B-52s, you know. They keep flying the same gear because it basically works, and it's kind of the same in that industry. I mean, a lot of this gear was put in in the 20s and 30s, and then every 20 years there's, a, there's an updated control. So, you know, you got 20, 25-year replacement cycle on this stuff. So the opportunity is rare, but when it's done, it's done very, it's not cheap, but it's done very carefully because it's a big capital investment with substantial risk, you know. I mean, you're like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, overhauling a loaded weapon, you know. It's not what you really want to do because they don't shut it down for this except for very, very brief time frame. So a lot of you, you're doing live with live pot oil in it or something like that. So, yes. I can make a comment. I, I do build a guy motion from Lockheed Martin Space System. Ah. And your comment about uh, stuff not getting along. Uh, I have give you one really latest nightmare. I have a, a one building. We have 50 buildings not very far from here. And uh, I have 70,000 control points. Oh, yeah. It just, actually, it's about 80,000, but 70,000 that I know of. And uh, we had a clean room building, and there were over a off with the satellites in the room, in, in this large room. Yeah. Put a brand new humidifier on my control network. The minute I commissioned the keypad and the controller, it never shut up. Yeah. It took down the entire building. I couldn't even decommission it. I had to go to the building and unplug it. <laughs> most, yeah. of these, most of these SCADA system vendors and dust control system vendors really don't play well with anybody yeah. except themselves. Well, and that's, that's a nightmare I we fight every day. One, one of the really interesting problems you run into a lot is this. <coughs> so, so somebody's got an asset, let's say a pipeline arbitrarily, and it's running, you know, I don't know how much revenue a day, but millions, you know, really high value stuff because, you know, all the production of this company is coming through this 136 inch pipeline. So, so it's, it's, it's funny when you think about it in retrospect, except it's not so funny when it's happening. So there's somebody in, you know, kind of corporate IT goes, you know, these guys, they've got fiber down this pipeline, and so, um, so it's going to be a really good idea. We'll shut off our T1, and we're going to run our network corporate traffic on the fiber running down the pipeline because we can save $1,500 a month. And so unbeknownst, and you know how bureaucracies and organizations do, they go around and come up with the wrong answer, and somebody flips the switch, and the pipeline goes offline and all that, you know, and, that's a typical problem we get into, and then nobody has visibility exactly why, and you know, and typically we're heroes because they get called in a panic, and you know, within an hour or so, we'll get enough data and just take a laptop and a probe, and you know, we're not calling much data, and we'll say, well, look at all this stuff, man. So, so, you, so is your pipeline node speaking email and web and <laughs> porn these days, or what? You know, so. That's the, those are simple but tragic things that happen when people try to combine it properly, no QoS. Yes. So you find that uh, it's, it's faster to solve the problem to go down to the packet level and see what's happening rather than try to look at change logs and see who broke something? Well, if you believe the change logs, it's a wonderful thing. But, you know, oddly, you know, what are their... 
you know, four lies, you know, lies, damn lies, statistics, and change logs, you know. <laughs> Unless I'm seeing it off tripwire, I don't believe it. Right. I mean, full stop, you know. And, and, and the thing is, a packet trace doesn't lie. I mean, it's the, what traversed the network, not somebody's opinion on what they think they changed, you know. And I mean, even good people, I've done it myself, you know, you can make a log entry to the best of your ability and still get it wrong. I've done it myself, you know. I count myself pretty meticulous when it comes to that, but you can get it wrong. But again, packets don't lie. See what the network is telling you. Yes, sir. Mike, I was wondering, so on the vessel, even though it's a low bandwidth network, since it's very mission critical, do you find yourself implementing QoS yes. at three points to prevent anything from taking over? Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. every Several layer levels. to device. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. To device. Fun fundamental to the whole whole thing of doing it right is, you know, capacity planning and getting the QoS schema agreed to and correct. That's fundamental to the whole thing. And then testing it vigorously. So, you know, we'll take uh, and run traffic, but we'll have, you know, devices, a couple of Linux servers that we'll put on either side, and we'll just saturate one VLAN, and we'll let's see what the other one does. You know, and all this is part of, you know, a proper test scheme to make sure the QoS is effective, so if you have a runaway event, virus, whatever, uncontrolled event, you're not taking down other VLANs and other physical systems. So, yes, absolutely, we test that. Absolutely. Being an industry defender, do you find... Uh protocols other than TCP IP, so the application writing custom apps over Ethernet directly? Uh, well, I mean, in the industrial control, you will see, and Wireshark is useful, but it's, you'll see Propagat, Modbus, and, and this sort of thing, but Wireshark handles that. I mean, oh. Wireshark can, uh, uh, I don't know if you've done it, but I mean, Wireshark has the, the sectors for, you know, Modbus, uh, Profi, the common stuff, and they work. I mean, I, I mean, we have very little complaint about Wireshark other than, you know, I mean, it is slow. You load a big packet trace in a graphical wire chart, and it, 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 it's not fast to render, but it, it's the way you have to look at it if you want to look. It's the best thing to look, we found, at, at, the, at the packet level. So, But it, it has what you need fundamentally. There's not anything magically different about the fundamental network engineering. It's more the discipline. You, know, you have to do everything right, and, and you have to understand... You know, the, the, the gentleman this morning that gave the talk about the, the what, what his anagram device. Yeah. That, that's that, the flow. Yeah, 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 flow. You know, that's a very interesting concept to us because that could potentially solve a lot of our issues. But the reality is I can't buy that device today. And so you're dealing with the same, you know, we're dealing fundamentally, you know, uh, with, with Cisco switches and Cisco routers you know, and just the mid-range stuff, not the big enterprise stuff, because we're not worried about huge capacity, but it's properly configuring and, and getting those devices correct and, and proving that the configurations are correct. So it's a lot of, you know, QoS planning is a big thing. We, we build a simple matrix and say, okay, these are your choices, and the clients don't like it at first because they say, well, I want this here and this here and this here and this here, and we just take a little magical spreadsheet and say, okay, well, you know, you could... So, okay, well, you'll need a 10 megabit SATCOM, and that'll cost you only, you know, more money than you can possibly do, and we can't fit it on the vessel, so what are you going to give away? You know, so, you know, it's, it's a lot of interaction with the client, educating and helping them to make the correct, correct discipline decisions based on their operational stuff. If you do it right, you know, you have a lot of conversation, a lot of pre-planning to get to an agreement of what the schema is, because we don't know, you know, we don't know what is necessarily most important to the client, so you have to come to an agreement with them and institute that based on their business needs, essentially. But QoS is an absolute key. You know. And one of the things we look at all the time, I mean, you know, look for the markings, and, you know, look if it's acting correctly and all that. Yes, sir? Do uh, you have any sort of... Uh uh, on-demand, under direct control, uh, packet injection capability in your probes, or just flat out prohibit that? Flat out prohibit it. Have no ability to do it. Don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I I know that there are there are tap products, there are hard products you can get that can do that, and that could be useful in certain cases. Mm -hmm. But one of our fundamental pre precepts we, we preach to our clients, and one of the reasons what they allow us to put our stuff out in, is we can prove to the client that we, there's nothing we can do with our management port that affects anything on the network under management. We always use an interval tap, fail safe, so they can cut the power, they can you know, hack our box in half, and until they cut that little internal circuit you know, to the tap, to it from the tap, 
we can't affect or perturbate their network. So we don't do that. If we do need to generate traffic, we'll put a secondary box on and use some of the common performance tools or certain apps, whatever, to, to drive uh, traffic. So, so I, I recognize the utility of doing that. We just don't do that. We also tend not to really do security practice, although you know our, our stuff, could, our files can be easily consumed by an IDS engine or something like that. We tend not to do it, but we do see security issues, and then we just raise them in a report and say, hey, look, uh, external telnet to all your service, bad thing, don't do that. <laughs> but again, it's a basic, you know, it's like, hey, do this, you know, and, huh, external telnet, bad thing, you know. Put in a report, you know, alert the client. But we, we don't do a security practice, really. You know, we, we tend to focus on the packet performance, yeah, you know, network and application performance. We used to call ourselves network performance guys, and that wasn't sufficient, so we called network and application performance, because at the end of the day, the client wants to see his app run. Now, maybe network issues are very network centric, but we tried to, you know, say it's really all or all of that. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, uh, other questions? So, so you've been doing it for 20 years, is that why it's YR20? The original founders of the company were two Scottish gentlemen. At that time, they had both been in the industry more than 20 years. So that was 20 years, and they wanted a nonsense name, that, you know, like Exxon or something like that, so they just said YR20. And then when I joined the company in 05, and we redid the company and you know, incorporated the U.S., by then we've had more like about 90 years old between us, and so we, uh, but we left the name because it's really expensive in the UK to change company names, and there was some industry recognition, so we just left it. But that was the original thing, is the two founders had more than 20 years of experience. So, you know, they were the guy, I'm sorry? One of the things that, you know, I found about you guys is you really know how to tune applications very well because of the locations that you're that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that, you know, core networks are really interesting, but we operate so much on the network edge where latency becomes latency low bandwidth, and so we're trying to solve that problem. And really, once you, tune, once you solve that problem, once you make it work there, it works great on your network core, too. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing different. If, but if you do it right so it operates on the network edge, it will operate really good in the core. So there, there isn't really a differentiation in our minds. It's just that the network edge and the high latency tends to accentuate all problems. You know, packet loss, recover slow, um, latency, low, you know, uh, you know, inappropriate packet sizes, all those things become very evil. So, but just years of experience in looking at it. What does it? <laughs> Sometimes you know, you know, oh my God, what is this? And, you know, it, 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 it's weird. You know, after a while, after you get used to looking at packet traces, it, it becomes a bit more intuitive, you know, because you start to see, you, there's certain things you just tend to see commonly, so I guess it's just the experience of doing it and that, that, that helps at a, time, at, a, at a point. So, practice, you know, that everybody's dead right. Look at lots of traces. Get somebody to pull a trace, it's bad. Get somebody to pull a trace, it's really good. And, you know, I can probably show you some traces that to me are perfectly fine, but you'll scream in horror because you'll say, oh, my God, look at the latency or this, that, and the other, or here's a few out-of-orders that pack, but, but packet charts and interpreting is, uh, wire charts and interpreting is, you know, incorrectly, maybe is lost segments just due to the, where we're capturing it and all that. They're still fine. You know, so you have to kind of, really understand what it's saying. You know, there's always that human element there. It's a great tool, but it's not it's not an automated tool, per se. It's a, it's a fantastic tool. You know, I, there's, a, there's a great saying that somebody said, you know, a tool, you know, it, 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 a, a tool, it, you know, they were talking about a hammer. It, it's, it's not a hand tool, it's a mind tool. You know, it's the same thing. Once you understand the problem and what your tool is doing, you can effectively use it. If you just go bang on things, Gets you nowhere. Wireshark is very analogous to that. You know, it can confuse you. It can do all kinds of things. But it's a it's a great tool. I mean, it's, it does what it does very very well. Other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, no one else is asking. Uh, when you've got a uh, uh, high availability, high reliability system like this, you typically have a lot of redundancy. 
do you find that you have to think carefully about where to put your probe so that you yeah. capture all the parallel links? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's a probe placement is always more critical than people think. And it, you, you always have to think through that. And, you know, one of the things that just drives us crazy in corporate networks, you know, edge networks are usually better because they're somewhat simpler and they were put into place by simple people that are more uh, critically minded about the mission, let's say. Core networks, the, the worst curse you can have or ever have is to go into a network and the description is everything's slow or everything's broken. And, and you talk to people and say, well, what do you mean everything? Well, everything's broken. Well, that's not strictly true. Uh, and then we'll, we'll say, okay, well, can we talk to some user? Yeah, yeah, and then you'll try to do that. But the worst, that's horrible, but the worst is that you say, well, can we have your network diagram? Well, we don't actually have it. <laughs> well, we can, we can provide you a high-speed film. <laughs> so, so there, you usually, you say, okay, okay, look, listen, whatever we quoted you, let's rethink that, because we need about three days in here to basically do some basic mapping of the network. Okay, let's go look at, you know, so we go in and draw simple diagrams of routers and switches and how they're interacting connected and try to get a basic picture, use some tools, figure out then and where to place the devices and where to collect the data. And sometimes we get it wrong. You know, it's just not what we thought. And so there's an iterative process that's very costly really for the client. So the best thing is good network diagrams and an accurate description of problems. That greatly simplifies the problem. It solves the clients tons of money. So very important thing is, and so yes, that was a very roundabout thing. That, yes, probe, probe placement, data collection point, it, it's extremely critical. You've got to get it right, and it matters when you're interpreting data. Gerald knows. <laughs> you know, so the interpretation over here and the interpretation over here through latency have to be considered because, you know, the absolute perfect thing you could ever have. There's two synced up collection devices collecting symmetrically on both sides. That's heaven for an analyst because the, an the question is fully answered no matter what you encounter. It's just that that happy state is never <laughs> achievable. So we, we've done it occasionally, but it's just so hard to do it in anybody's real world that, that, that it's, it's just so impossible. Can't do it. So, is that helpful? So, yes, probe placement, data collection, very, very important. Anything else? I'll end it then. And uh, if anybody needs anything else, uh, call. I'll try to provide things. And if there's any particular little examples I can give or whatever, be glad to try to supplement. Okay. Thank you very much.